Emmett Fox What are the lessons Jesus taught us? Jesus Christ is, without a doubt, the most transcendental figure in the history of mankind. No matter the perspective from which one examines him, his relevance is undeniable, and he deserves unanimous recognition. This statement is valid, regardless of whether he is considered a divinity, as if he is conceived as a human being. If we consider him in his human facet, whether as the most eminent prophet and global educator, or simply as a passionate enthusiast with good intentions. He saw his path marked by suffering, failure and desolation, after a brief but tumultuous public exposure. Regardless of how he is perceived, the fact remains that the life and death of Jesus, as well as the teachings attributed to him, had more influence on mankind, than those of any other man who ever lived. More than Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, Napoleon, or Washington. His doctrines, or at least those attributed to him today, have had a greater impact on the lives of more people. More books are written, read, and bought about him. More speeches, let's call them sermons, are delivered than about all the other men mentioned together. The fact of having been the religious inspiration, of the entire European race throughout the two millennia, in which that race, has dominated and shaped the destiny of the whole world, both culturally, socially and politically. As well as in the period in which the entire surface of the earth, was finally discovered and occupied, and in its broad contours shaped by civilization, by itself alone gives it the right, to the first position worldwide. And therefore, there can be no more important undertaking, than to inquire into the question of what Jesus really stood for. What did Jesus teach us? What does he really want us to believe and do? What goals did he have in his heart, and to what extent did he succeed in achieving those goals, in his life and death? To what extent did the religion or movement called Christianity, over the last nineteen centuries, really express or represent his ideas? To what extent does Christianity today, communicate his message to the world? If he were to return now, what would he think of the self-styled Christian nations in general, as well as the Christian churches in particular? The Anglicans, Baptists, Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Methodists, Presbyterians, Guatrists, Salvationists, Seventh-day Adventists, or Unitarians. What was the teaching that Jesus imparted to us? This is the question I have set out to answer, throughout this book. I propose to show that the message that Jesus brought, has a unique and special value. For it is the truth, as well as the only perfect statement, of the truth of the nature of God and of man, of life and of the world, as well as of the relationships that exist between them. Moreover, we will discover that its teachings are not a mere abstract account of the universe, which would only be of academic interest. On the contrary, they constitute a practical method for the development of the soul, as well as for the shaping of our lives and destinies, into the things we really want them to be. Jesus explains to us what the nature of God is, and what our own nature is. He explains to us the meaning of life and death. He teaches us why we make mistakes, why we yield to temptation, or why we become sick, impoverished and old. More importantly, it tells us how all these evils can be overcome, and how we can bring health, happiness and true prosperity to our lives and the lives of others, if we really want it. Having said the above, we can now emphasize, that the first aspect to understand, is a fact of fundamental importance, as it means to depart, from all the ordinary prepositions of orthodoxy. The fact to be emphasized is that Jesus did not teach any theology. The teaching of Jesus is entirely spiritual or metaphysical. Unfortunately, historical Christianity has been largely concerned, with theological and doctrinal issues that, oddly enough, play no role in the teaching of the Gospel. It will surprise many good people, to know that all the doctrines and theologies of the churches, are human inventions, elaborated by their authors from their own biases, and imposed on the Bible from the outside. Nevertheless, this reality persists. In truth, 
There is absolutely no theological system or doctrine, to be found in the pages of the Bible. They are simply human constructions. Virtuous people who felt the need for an intellectual explanation of life, and who also held the belief that the Bible was a divine revelation. These people came to the logical conclusion, that one thing must be inside the other. More or less unconsciously, they sought to fabricate the thing they wished to find. They did not have the spiritual or metaphysical key. Indeed, they were not in what is called, the spiritual basis, and therefore, they were looking for an explanation, purely intellectual or three-dimensional explanation of life. And it is not possible for such an explanation to exist. The fact that man possesses an essentially spiritual and eternal life, is the real explanation of his life. This world and the life which we intellectually know are, so to speak, but a cross-section of the whole truth concerning him. Whereas a cross-section of anything, from a machine to a horse, can never provide even a partial explanation of the whole. This perspective only glimpses a small corner of the universe, and that even with eyes half open, and starting from a point of view exclusively centered on humanity and the earth. The human being, built fables as extravagant as disturbing, about an unlimited God with human form. The one who directed his universe, in a similar way, to how an ignorant and rudimentary prince, could manage the affairs, of a small oriental kingdom. To this being, all kinds of human weaknesses were imputed, such as vanity, inconstancy, and rancor. Later, a far-fetched and very incongruous legend was constructed, about original sin, about vicarious blood atonement, about infinite punishment for finite transgressions. And in certain cases, an unspeakably dreadful doctrine was added, about predestination to eternal torment, or eternal bliss. However, this theory was never taught in the Bible. If the purpose of the Bible were to teach it, it would be perfectly set forth in some chapter, but it is not. The plan of salvation, so prominent in evangelical sermons, and in the divinity books of an earlier generation, is absent in the Bible. No such agreement ever existed in the universe, and the Bible does not teach it at all. And instead, certain obscure texts from Genesis, some phrases taken at random from Paul's letters, as well as one or two isolated verses, from other parts of the scriptures, could be extracted and joined together by theologians. All in order to produce the kind of teaching, which in their view should be in the Bible. Jesus, on the other hand, knows nothing of all this. He is far from being a Pollyanna, as they say, or any optimist. He warns us not once, but many times, that obstinacy in sin, brings with it a very severe punishment. Just as it happens with the man, who separates himself from the integrity of his soul. Even if he were to gain the whole world, he would be a tragic fool. However, it teaches that the punishments are a real and direct consequence of our sins. And it shows us that any individual, no matter how permeated with wickedness and impurity, always has direct access to an almighty and loving God the Father. Who will forgive him, and provide him with his own strength, which will allow him to find himself again, and up to seventy times seven, if necessary. Bible 13.5 Jesus has been sadly misunderstood and misrepresented, in other directions. Thus, for example, there is no justification of any kind in his teachings, for the establishment of any form of ecclesiastical, or any hierarchy of officials or ritual system. He approved of none of that, and in fact, his mentality is definitely contrary, to the ecclesiastical. For the duration of his public life, he was at war, with the ecclesiastics and other religious officials, of his own country. They hindered him at first, and then persecuted him, owing to a perfectly sound instinct of self-preservation. They felt instinctively that the truth, in the way he taught it, constituted the beginning of the end for them, so they finally killed him. Their claims to authority as representatives of God, he ignored them entirely, and for their ritual and ceremonies, he showed only impatience and contempt. Human nature seems to be very prone, to believe what it wants to believe, 
rather than undertake the work of really searching the scriptures, with an open mind. For example, perfectly sincere men, have called themselves Christian leaders, and have clothed themselves with the most imposing and pretentious titles, the better to impress people. In spite of the fact that their teacher, in the plainest language, strictly commanded his followers, that they were to do nothing of the kind. But do not pretend to be called, Rabbi, for one is your master, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Matthew 23 8 Furthermore, he denounced the Pharisees as hypocrites, because they love the chief seats and bind heavy burdens, difficult to carry, with all kinds of rules and regulations, as we shall see later. Jesus did not ask for the fulfillment of strict norms or rules. What he insisted on, was that a certain spirit prevail in one's conduct, seeking to teach only principles. Aware that when the spirit is right, the details are aligned to this, and that in fact, the letter kills but the spirit enlivens, as sadly could be observed in the actions of the Pharisees. In spite of this, Orthodox Christianity has tried at all costs, to impose on the people all kinds of strict rules or regulations. A striking case that illustrates this is the Puritan attempt to impose the Old Testament Sabbath on Christians, although this was a purely Hebrew ordinance. Even so, fierce punishments were given to those who broke it, in spite of the fact that Jesus discouraged the superstitious command of the Sabbath, saying that the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. He clearly indicated throughout his teachings that the time has come for man to make each and every day a spiritual Sabbath, acting at all times in a spiritual context. It is obvious that if the Hebrew Sabbath was obligatory for Christians, then now that they rest on Sunday, they are still incurring in all the faults of Sabbath breaking. There are many modern Christians who realize that there is no system of theology in the Bible, unless one wants to put it there deliberately. And they have practically abandoned theology altogether, but still cling to Christianity, because they feel intuitively that it is the truth. In reality, there is no logical justification for their attitude, since they do not possess the spiritual key, which makes the teaching of Jesus intelligible. Therefore, they strive to rationalize their attitude in various ways. This is the dilemma of man, who has neither the blind faith of orthodoxy, nor the spiritual interpretation of scientific Christianity, with which to sustain himself. He has no sustenance to lean on, other than that of old-fashioned Unitarianism, and if he does not reject miracles altogether, he is at least very uncomfortable with them. They embarrass him, and he wishes they were not in the Bible, and would be glad in his heart to be rid of them. A Life of Jesus, just published by a well-known clergyman, clearly illustrates how false this position is. The author admits in this book, that Jesus may have healed some people, or helped them to heal themselves, but he draws the line at this point. The other miracles, he explains them as if they did not exist. According to him, these are the usual fantastic legends, which revolve around all the great historical figures. Thus, as an example, we can remember what happened at the lake, where the disciples were very frightened, but thought of Jesus, and that thought calmed their fears. Later, they exaggerated in an absurd story, that he had come to them in person, walking on the water. Apparently, on another occasion, he reformed a sinner by bringing him out of the tomb of sin, and this was expanded years and years later, into a ridiculous legend, that he had actually revived a dead man. Again, Jesus prayed fervently one night, so that he was seen beaming with happiness. And Peter, who had fallen asleep, woke up startled, and years later told a confusing story, about believing that he had seen Moses there. And so was the transfiguration, and so on to this day. Now, one must extend all sympathy and special pleas, to a man captivated by the beauty and mystery of the Gospels. However, in the absence of the spiritual key, he considers that his common sense, and all the scientific knowledge of mankind, are mocked, by much of what is contained in these Gospels. But this is simply not possible. The rest of the Gospel account loses its meaning entirely, if the miracles never took place, if Jesus never believed in their possibility, 
nor undertook to perform them. It is not truthful to assert that he only presented them occasionally, and in fact, he exhibited them constantly and repeatedly. And if he did not believe, and taught many things in frank contradiction, with the rationalistic philosophy of the 18th and 19th century, the gospel account is chaotic, contradictory and devoid of all meaning. We cannot get out of the dilemma by saying that Jesus was not interested in the beliefs and superstitions of his time, and that he took them more or less for granted, because what really interested him was character. All this is a weak argument, for character, must include an intelligent and vital reaction to life, and this includes some definite beliefs and convictions, about the things that really matter. However, miracles did happen, all the works recounted of Jesus in the four Gospels, did happen, and many others as well, which, if each were written, I believe would not fit the breadth of the earth. Jesus himself justified, what people considered a strange and wonderful teaching, by the works he was able to do. And he went further, and said in reference to those who study and practice his teaching, the works that I do, you will do, and even greater. Now, and after all, what do we call a miracle? Those who deny the possibility of miracles, on the grounds that the universe is a perfect system of law and order, in the operation of which there can be no exceptions, are absolutely right. The explanation for this, is that the world we normally know, and whose laws are techniques known to most people, is only a fragment of the whole universe, as it is in reality. Therefore, there is the appeal from a lower law to a higher one, from a lower expression to a higher one. However, the appeal of the lower law to the higher, is not really a violation of the law, for the possibility of such an appeal, is part of the main constitution of the universe. Therefore, in the sense of a true violation of the law, miracles are impossible. But in the sense, that all the ordinary rules and limitations of the physical plane, can be set aside and overruled, by an understanding, which has risen above them. Miracles, in the colloquial sense of the word, can and do occur. Let us imagine, in order to give an example, that on any given Monday, your affairs are in such a state, that humanly speaking it is certain, that certain consequences will occur before the end of the week. However, these may be legal consequences, perhaps of a very unpleasant nature, following some decision of the courts, or they may be certain physical consequences, on the human body. It is possible that a competent doctor, may decide that a dangerous operation is absolutely necessary, and even consider it his responsibility to say, that there is no chance of the patient to recover. But if someone can raise his consciousness, above the limitations of the physical plane, in relation to the matter, and this is only a scientific description, what is commonly called prayer. Then, the conditions on that plane would change. In some totally unexpected and normally impossible way, the legal adversity could dissipate. And to the benefit of all parties involved in the matter, the patient might recover, without undergoing the operation, or might find relief, instead of facing a fatal outcome. In other words, so-called miracles, in the common sense of the word, can and do happen as a result of prayer. Prayer changes things, praying makes things happen very differently from how they would have happened if prayer had not been said. It makes no difference what kind of difficulty you have. No matter what causes have led you to it, it is enough to pray your way out of your problem, if you are persistent enough in your appeal to God. Moreover, prayer is a science and an art, and it was to the teaching of this science and this art that Jesus devoted most of his ministry. If the miracles of the gospel occurred, it is because Jesus understood the spiritual world, which gave greater power to his prayer than to that of anyone else, either before or after him. It is necessary, to take into account another interpretation of the gospels. Tolstoy, forced himself in presenting the Sermon on the Mount, as a practical guide for life, considering its precepts literally at face value, and ignoring the spiritual interpretation, of which he was not aware. As well as excluding the plane of the Spirit, in which he did not believe. By discarding the whole Bible except the four Gospels, and discarding all miracles, he made a heroic but futile attempt to combine Christianity in materialism. 
And of course, he failed. His real place in history, does not lie in being the founder of a new religious movement, but in being the man whose practical anarchism, driven by genius, paved the way for the Bolshevik Revolution. Similar to how Joshua had prepared the ground for the French Revolution. It is the spiritual key that unlocks the mystery of biblical teaching in general, and of the Gospels in particular. It is the spiritual key that explains the miracles, and shows that they were performed to demonstrate to us, that we too can work miracles, and thus overcome sin, sickness and limitation. Thanks to this key, we can afford to emphasize verbal inspiration, and all superstitious literalism, and yet understand, that the Bible is really the most precious and authentic possession, of all those of man. Looking at it from the outside, the Bible is a collection of inspired documents, written by men of all kinds, in all kinds of circumstances, and over hundreds of years. These documents, as we have them, are almost never original, as they are redactions and compilations of ancient fragments, and the names of the actual writers, are seldom known with certainty. However, this does not affect in the least, the spiritual purpose of the Bible. And in fact, it is quite irrelevant. The book as it stands, is an inexhaustible reservoir of spiritual truth, compiled under divine inspiration. And the actual route by which it arrived at its present form, is not important. The name of the author of a specific chapter, is as insignificant as the name of its scribe, if the author were to be mentioned. What really matters is the divine wisdom, and that is what concerns us. The so-called higher criticism, focuses only on the external, leaving aside completely, the spiritual content of the scriptures. And from the spiritual point of view, history is not important. Biography, lyric and other poetic forms are various means by which the spiritual message is given in the Bible. Parables are used to convey spiritual and metaphysical truth. Many times, what was never intended to be more than a parable, was taken at the time, as a literal statement of fact, which often made the Bible appear to teach things that are contrary to common sense. An example is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If understood correctly, it is perhaps the most wonderful parable of all. Its author never intended it to be taken for history, but literal-minded people took it that way, with all sorts of absurd consequences. The spiritual key of the Bible saves us from all these difficulties, dilemmas and apparent inconsistencies. It saves us from the false positions of ritualism, evangelicalism and so-called liberalism alike, because it gives us the truth. This truth turns out to be nothing less, than the amazing but undeniable fact, that the whole external world, be it the physical body, the common things of life, the winds, the rain, the clouds. The earth itself, lends itself to the thought of man, and that he has dominion over it, when he knows it. The outer world, far from being the prison of circumstances, which it is commonly supposed to be, in reality, has no character of its own, neither good nor bad. It has only the character that we attribute to it, consciously or unconsciously. On a day-to-day -day basis, all the thoughts that occupy your mind, secret tulyagar as Jesus calls it, are shaping your destiny, for better or for worse. In fact, to tell the truth, the whole experience of our life is nothing more than the outward expression of inner thought. Now, we can choose the kind of thoughts we harbor. It will be a little difficult to break a bad thinking habit, but it can be done. In fact, we always choose, and therefore, our lives are the result, of the kind of thoughts we have chosen to have. So they are of our own order, and hence, there is perfect justice in the universe. We do not suffer for another man's original sin, but we reap, what we ourselves have sown. We have free will, but our free will lies in our choice of thought. This is, in essence, what Jesus taught. It is, as we shall see, the underlying message of the whole Bible, although it is not expressed with the same clarity throughout the book. At the beginning of the book, it shines faintly, like the light of a heavily lidded lamp. But as time goes on, one veil after another is removed, 
and the light shines brighter and brighter. Until in the teaching of Jesus Christ, it shines clear and unobstructed on this plane. What we have to address, is man's understanding of the truth, and throughout history, this has been steadily and continuously refined. In fact, what we call progress, is but the outward expression, corresponding to the idea of God, in which mankind continually improves. Jesus Christ summarized this truth, taught it fully and thoroughly, and above all, demonstrated it in his own person. At present, most of us can glimpse intellectually, the idea of what it must mean in its fullness, and much more of what it must inevitably derive, from a competent understanding of it. However, all that we can demonstrate is a very different matter. Acceptance of the truth is the great first step, but we shall not have taken it, until we demonstrate it in practice. Jesus demonstrated all that he taught, including the overcoming of death, in what we call resurrection. For reasons I cannot discuss here, it happens that every time you overcome a difficulty by prayer, you help the whole human race, past, present and future, in a general way. And it has helped to overcome that special kind of difficulty, in particular. Jesus, by overcoming all kinds of limitations, to which mankind is subject, and in particular by overcoming death, performed a work of unique and incalculable value to the race. For this reason, he is justly entitled, as the Savior of the world. When he considered that the time was ripe, he set out to summarize all that he had achieved, in a series of lectures that extended probably, for several days. In these lectures, he spoke probably two or three times a day. He took this opportunity to summarize the message, and dotted the I's and crossed the T's, so to speak. Naturally, some of those present took notes, and later, these notes were edited into what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. The authors of the four Gospels, each one selected the material for his monograph, according to his own purpose. It is Matthew who gives us the most complete and carefully ordered version of the discourse. The Sermon on the Mount, is an almost perfect codification of the religion of Jesus Christ, and that is why I have chosen it as the text for this book. It is practical and personal, it is definitive, specific, and yet, amply enlightening. Once the true meaning of the instructions is grasped, it is only necessary to begin to faithfully put them into practice, to obtain immediate results. The degree and magnitude of these results will depend solely on the sincerity and thoroughness with which they are applied. This is a question, which each individual must solve for himself. No one can save his brother's soul, nor pay his brother's debt. One can and should help others on special occasions, but in the long run, everyone must learn to do his own work, and sin no more, lest something worse happen to him. Now, if you really want to change your life, if you really want to become a totally different person in the eyes of God and men, if you really want health, peace of mind and spiritual development. Then Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, has clearly shown you how to do it. But this is not an easy task, and although we know that it can be done, because there are those who have done it, it is necessary to pay a price. And the price is the actual application of these principles, in every corner of your life, as well as in every daily transaction, whether you want to do it or not, but especially where you would prefer not to. If you are prepared to pay that price, to really and truly break away from the old man, and begin to create the new, then the study of the great sermon, will be for you the mountain of deliverance. Seeing the crowds, he went up a mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and taking the word, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they persecute you for my sake, and speak all kinds of evil against you, lying. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. The Sermon on the Mount begins with these eight Beatitudes. It is, of course, one of the best-known sections of the Bible. Even people whose knowledge of the scriptures is limited to half a dozen of the best-known chapters are probably familiar with the Beatitudes. Unfortunately, they hardly ever understand them, and usually consider them to be a counsel of perfection, with no real application to daily life. But this is only because they lack the spiritual key. The Beatitudes are actually a prose poem of eight verses, which is complete in itself, and is practically a general summary of all Christian teaching. It is a spiritual rather than a literary summary, summarizing the spirit of the teaching rather than the letter. Such a general summary is highly characteristic of the ancient Eastern way of approaching a religious and philosophical teaching. It is naturally reminiscent of the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, the Ten Commandments of Moses, and other compact groupings of ideas. Jesus devoted himself exclusively to the teaching of general principles, and these general principles always had to do with mental states. He knew that if someone's mental states are correct, everything else must also be correct. Whereas if they are wrong, nothing else can be right. Contrary to the great religious teachers, he does not give us detailed instructions about what we should or should not do. It does not tell us to abstain from eating or drinking certain things, or to perform various religious rites at certain times and seasons. And in fact, the whole current of his teaching, is anti-ritualistic and anti-formalist. At no time did he show sympathy, for the Jewish priesthood and its theory of salvation, through the fulfillment of certain rules. The hour is coming when you will not worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, he said. The hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipper will worship the Father, in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks those who worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him, in spirit and in truth. The Pharisees, because of their strict set of detailed rules, were the group to which he showed real intolerance. From their perspective, every Pharisee was extremely meticulous, and had to comply with numerous external details on a daily basis, before they felt they had complied, with God's demands. According to a modern rabbi, the number of such details is not less than 600. And since it is evident that no human being could actually carry out such things in practice, the natural result would be that the victim, being aware of being far short of fulfilling his duties, would necessarily have to labor under a chronic feeling of sin. To consider oneself a sinner is, for all practical purposes, to be a sinner, with all the consequences that flow from that condition. However, Jesus' policy contrasts with this. For his aim, is to strip the heart of all confidence in external things, both for pleasurable glorification and for spiritual salvation, and to incite a new attitude of mind. This policy, is graphically set forth in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here we must bear in mind, a point of great practical importance, in the study of the Bible. Namely, that the terms and expressions, and sometimes the words themselves, are used in the Bible in a sense, which is clearly different from everyday usage. In reality, the Bible is a book of metaphysics, a manual for the growth of the soul, and contemplates all questions from this point of view. It is not possible to insist too much on this, so it adopts the broadest point of view, on all subjects. Contemplating all things, in their relation to the human soul, and employing many common terms, in a much wider sense than common usage gives them. For example, the word bread, in the Bible does not mean simply any kind of physical food, which is the broader interpretation, which is given to it in the general literature. Rather, it means all things that man needs, all physical things such as clothing, housing, money, education, companionship, and so on. And above all, it represents spiritual things, such as spiritual perception, spiritual understanding, and preeminently spiritual realization. Give us this day our daily bread. I am the bread of life. 
Another example is the word prosperity. In the biblical sense, prosper means much more than the acquisition of material possessions. In reality, it means success in prayer. Success in prayer is, from the soul's point of view, the only kind of prosperity worth having. Moreover, if our prayers are successful, we will naturally obtain all the material things we need. But material wealth is really the least important thing in life, and this is implied in the Bible, by giving the word, prosperous, its true meaning. The fact of being, poor in spirit, does not mean at all, what today we call, poor in spirit. Poverty of spirit means to have stripped oneself of all desire to exercise one's personal will. And what is equally important, to have renounced all preconceived opinions, in the sincere search for God. This means being willing, if necessary, to set aside your present way of thinking, your present views and prejudices, your present way of life. In fact, to discard everything that might stand in your way of finding God. One of the saddest passages in all literature, is the story of the rich young man, who lost a great opportunity to be happy, and instead, only had great possessions left. This is the story of humanity, in broad strokes, we reject the salvation that Jesus offers us, our chance to find God, because we only seek great possessions. Not in the least because we are rich, in terms of money, because in fact, most people are not, but because we have great possessions, forms of preconceived ideas, confidence in our own judgment, and ideas with which we happen to be familiar. Spiritual pride born of academic distinction, sentimental or material attachment, to institutions and organizations. Habits of life we do not wish to give up, concern for human respect, or perhaps fear of public ridicule. In short, an interest in worldly honor and distinction. These kinds of possessions, keep us chained to the rock of suffering, which is our exile from God. The rich young man is one of the most tragic characters in history. Not because he was rich, for wealth in itself is neither good nor bad, but because his heart was enslaved by the love of money, which Paul tells us is the root of all evil. He might have been a multimillionaire in silver and gold, and so long as his heart was not bent upon it, he would have been as free as the poorest beggar, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. However, his confidence was in his riches, and this shut him out. For the message of Christ, was not received with acclamation by the ecclesiastics of Jerusalem, because they had great possessions. Possessions of rabbinical learning, possessions of honor and public importance, positions of authority, as official teachers of religion. And these possessions, would have had to be sacrificed, to accept the spiritual teaching. The humble and unlettered, who listened to the teacher with pleasure, were happy not to have such possessions, which ostentatiously distanced them from the truth. Why in modern times, when the same simple message of Christ, about the imminence and availability of God, as well as about the inner light, which burns forever in the soul of man, was again his appearance in the world, was again gladly received, mostly only among the simple and unlettered. Why was it not the bishops, the deans, the ministers, and the presbyterians, who made it known to the world? Why was not Oxford, or Cambridge, or Harvard, or Heidelberg, the great seat of diffusion of this most important knowledge? Again, the answer is because they had great possessions, great possessions of intellectual and spiritual pride, great possessions of self-satisfaction and security, great possessions of academic commitment and social prestige. In contrast, the poor in spirit suffer none of these embarrassments, either because they have never had them, or because they have risen above them, in the tide of spiritual understanding. They are no longer intimidated by human authority, however august. No longer secure in their own opinions, they have realized that their most cherished beliefs, may have been and probably were, erroneous beliefs. And that all their ideas and views on life, may be false and need to be recast. They are ready to start over from the beginning, and learn life anew. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning, sadness, is not a good thing in itself, for of God's will, it is that all experience happiness and joyful success. 
Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. However, many times problems and suffering, are extremely useful, because many people do not bother to learn the truth, until they are pushed to do so by pain and failure. Then, pain becomes a relatively good thing. Sooner or later, every human being will have to discover the truth of God, and make his own first-hand contact with it. We have to know the truth, which will free us once and for all, from our three-dimensional limitations and their concomitants, sin, sickness and death. But most people, will not undertake the search for God wholeheartedly, unless they are driven to it, by some kind of problem. In reality, there is no need for man to have problems, because if he only seeks God first, the problems never have to come. One can always choose, between learning through spiritual development, or learning through painful experience, and it will be his fault, if he chooses the latter option. As a rule, only when health is broken, and ordinary medical means have failed to provide relief. It is when people get serious about gaining that spiritual understanding of the body as the true embodiment of divine life. Which is our only guarantee of overcoming illness, and ultimately, death. But if people would approach God, and gain some of this understanding while their health is still good, they would never have to be sick again. Usually, only when people, feel the pinch of poverty very acutely. That is, when ordinary material sources of supply have been exhausted, they turn to God as a last resort, and learn the lesson that divine power, is truly the source of man's supply. And that all material agents, are but the channels. But this lesson, has to be thoroughly learned and realized, before man, can pass on to any higher or wider experience, than the present one. There are many mansions in our Father's house, but the key to higher mansions is always the acquisition of absolute mastery over the one in which we find ourselves. It is therefore a great blessing that we are forced to straighten ourselves out in the matter of supply. At the earliest possible time, prosperous people, if they recognize God as their true source, praying for a greater spiritual understanding on this point, will never have to suffer poverty or financial problems. Simultaneously, they should be careful to use their present resources well, not hoarding wealth selfishly, but knowing that God is the owner, as well as that they, are only the stewards or trustees of it. The dominion of money implies a responsibility, which cannot be shirked. You have to manage it wisely, or assume the consequences. This general premise, has been implanted in each of our difficulties, not only in physical or financial problems, but in all other evils, of which the flesh is heir. Such as family difficulties, quarrels, estrangements, sin and remorse, and all the rest. They need not come at all, if we seek first the kingdom of God and right understanding, and if we do not, then they must come. For us, this morning will be a blessing in disguise, because through it, we will be comforted. Therefore, all persecution and hindrances come absolutely from within. Nevertheless, sentimental tradition holds us to it. There is no virtue in the martyrdom of not possessing. The martyr does not have a sufficient understanding of the truth, or it would be necessary for him to go through that experience. Jesus was not a martyr, for he could have been saved at any time, if he had wished to avoid crucifixion. It was necessary for someone to triumph over death, having actually died, but he deliberately chose for us, to do a certain work, and was not martyred. In no case should we despise the splendid courage, devotion and heroic self-denial, of the martyrs of all ages. But we must see that their understanding was incomplete, or they would not have been martyred. If you fix your attention on martyrdom, considering it as so many did, as the highest good, you will tend, as with anything you fix your attention on, to bring it to yourself. Although we may envy the moral and spiritual height they reached, we know that if the martyrs, had sufficiently loved their enemies, and I say, love, in the scientific sense of knowing the truth about them. Then, the Roman persecutors, even Nero himself, would have opened the prison doors to them, and the fanatic of the Inquisition, would have come to reconsider their cause.